Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of our two days online workshop on astronomy and astrophysics. Now we will move towards today's sessions by two different resource persons. The first resource person for today is Mr. Mahesh Shetty, sir. Mahesh Shetty, sir, is working as an assistant professor in physics at Wilson College, Mumbai. He is teaching physics since 1997. He is faculty with Center for Extramural Studies for certificate course in astronomy and astrophysics and certificate course in ancient Indian arts, crafts and science in Mumbai University. He is also secretary of Mumbai Sub-Regional Council of Indian Association of Physics Teachers. The topic which will be covered by Mahesh Shetty sir is about stars and star system. I hope you will get the required and the desired knowledge from his lecture and you will enjoy this lecture as well. Thank you. Dear physics teachers and students, let me first thank the management and principal of KTHM College and their physics department for inviting me to this workshop on astronomy and astrophysics. Special thanks to Professor Sneha Gua for personally interacting with me on deciding topics as well as uh, helping me out in recording this uh, lecture. What we shall be talking today is going to be about stars, different types of them, and by studying how do we know about them. And what do we study when we talk about stars? How do we know their life cycle? So let's start the journey. If you ask uh, how many stars are there in the sky, and if you go out in the night sky and observe different stars, uh, you may think that there are millions of stars there out in the sky. But in reality, however clear the sky is, however good vision you have, you may not be able to see more than something like 6,000 to 7,000 stars at a time. Uh, we can't see the huge number, but with the help of telescope, surely you can improve the vision. So when we can't see so many stars over here, uh, and whatever stars we are able to see, how do we categorize them? So we can categorize them by looking at them, their uh, colors or their brightness, and we'll see how all this information can be used. So first coming to the question, what are these constellations you might have heard about, like Orion, or Taurus, or Big Bear, or Gemini. So what are these constellations? Uh, if you look at this particular patch of sky here on the screen, okay, there is one particular conspicuous uh, uh, pattern of stars. You can see three stars in a line, and anybody who sees this in the sky won't forget it, because there's three bright stars forming a line. Uh, what are these? So, uh, the ancient Greeks called this uh, entire constellation as Orion. They saw a human being, Orion the hunter, uh, from their mythological figures. Indians consider this as Mriga or the deer with the four legs and arrow uh, shot by uh, another hunter called Vyad here. So, these are different kind of patterns and you see in different cultures people have given different kind of names to these patterns. Modern astronomy got developed in the West and they followed the Greek mythological uh, names which were given by different astronomers over the time and uh, now we call it uh, Orion constellation. So what is this constellation? You see the patterns over here. If you look at the faint stars, these faint stars form an arc. Uh, you can treat that as arc of uh, the or the shield uh, in the hand of Orion. Another arc over here is uh, you can easily imagine as the raised hand by Orion and a club in his hand. And then there are other various constellations. For example, Taurus is over here with a V-shape. This can be treated as face of the bull and two long horns. Uh, in the same way, uh, there are different kind of constellations named. Uh, the entire sky now has been divided into 88 different constellations and which means there are 88 different patterns. 
Now, are these different stars in the in this particular uh, constellation related to each other? Are they having any kind of physical physical influence on each other? Uh, or do they physically attract each other? So let's look at uh, them uh, closely. Now I have taken here the picture of Orion constellation. The orientation is slightly changed over here, but look at the stars. So this is Betelgeuse, and it is about 430 light years away from us. The next is Bellatrix, that is about 250 light years away from us. I am giving an approximate number here. Uh, next is Saif, uh, which is more than 700 light years away. Digel is again more than 700 light years away. Then there are three stars in the belt, al Nitak around 800 light years away, al Nilam more than 1300 light years away, and Mintaka more than 900 light years away. What you observe here is even these stars in the same constellation, they are not all at same distance. They are at various distances and if you look at Bellatrix star, okay, it is closer to sun as compared to say Alnitak or Alnitam. Okay, so uh, this particular pattern is important only when we see it from the location of sun or the orbit of earth going around the sun. Okay, if you are somewhere at a different, completely different location in the sky, this entire pattern will look completely different. If you are uh, around say planet, uh, if there is a planet around al Nilam, and if you are over there, then you may probably be able to see the similar kind of uh, Orion constellation on the other side of the sky, but uh, the central star will be missing because that is the star where you are located. Okay, so uh, the stars in a particular constellations are not physically related to each other. It is just a pattern that we observe here from Earth and that too when we only consider the bright stars. Let's go to uh, another object that we see in the sky. What we see is star clusters. Now star clusters are the regions where stars are actually uh, bound to each other. Take for example, it is beehive cluster. This particular beehive cluster uh, is uh, the, I mean, it is one of the very conspicuous objects, the fuzzy looking object, even with the naked eye in the sky. Uh, the ancient Indians called it uh, Kusha. Uh, the Greeks uh, have called it beehive cluster. And uh, there is another name given here, M44, indicating that it is 44th object in a catalog prepared by a French astronomer called Messier. So, it's 44th object in the Messier catalog. Now, uh, what is this object? So, we have cluster is supposed to be an open cluster. Open cluster means all the stars are close by but not very, very crowded. Okay, they are, they have gases among them. Okay, this is what is observed and uh, these stars, uh, the astronomers have concluded are relatively young stars because many of these stars are moving individually and when they have estimated the motion and then estimated the total mass of that entire cluster, they realize that though all these stars are gravitationally influencing each other, okay, the net uh, mass, whatever that particular cluster has, will have some kind of uh, escape velocity related to that and some of the stars are moving with velocity such uh, such high velocity that they may even escape this particular cluster over a long time. But since they have not yet escaped, probably this entire cluster is still young. That is what the astronomers have uh, given the reason, okay, and uh, that also helps us to see how young stars must be looking like, because if the cluster is young, uh, the stars are also young, because the entire cluster uh, is formed almost simultaneously from a huge cloud. We will see some of those features later. What will happen if these, if this particular cluster become very old, means the stars which are moving with high velocity leave this particular cluster, what happens? Then rest of the cluster comes together and what we get is a globular cluster. That is what 
uh, our present understanding is. So look at this particular globular cluster M72. Again, M72 means it is 72nd object in the catalog, Messier's catalog. Okay, and look at the the bright stars and look at how crowded it is. Okay, and uh, what people have realized is uh, this these kind of globular clusters are old because you don't find hydrogen gas within them, and uh, they are very crowded. Uh, so most of the stars show as uh, the signs of their old age. Now, how do we know whether the star is young or old? We'll come to it a bit later. Another greatest example, uh, in fact, this is the largest uh, globular cluster in our Milky Way galaxy. This is Omega Centauri. Uh, this is visible in the constellation of uh, Centaurus, which is visible in the southern sky. Okay, and because uh, Messier was French astronomer, uh, from the location of France, uh, he couldn't see this particular cluster. Therefore, you, you don't find uh, this particular object uh, in the Messier catalog. In fact, later some of the objects which were in the southern hemisphere, which could be seen from southern hemisphere, were added. But uh, this particular uh, Omega Centauri cluster is not added in the Messier catalog. But it is uh, one of the, it is in fact the largest uh, globular cluster in the entire Milky Way. So when you look at uh, all these stars, the question is how do we know what are they made up of? Uh, how do they behave? And modern science has given wonderful answers. Because remember, the entire modern science depends on experimentation. But with the stars, we can't do experiments. We can't play with them. We can't change their parameters. We can only sit and observe how they are behaving. And we have very sufficiently, uh, we don't have sufficient time. We have very small time uh, as compared to the life of the entire star. So let us see what kind of information we have got, what kind of observations we do. So going to the next slide here, what do we observe in stars? Uh, what we can observe in stars is its brightness or its color or what we call spectrum. So when it comes to brightness, let us look at uh, the magnitude, uh, the star's brightness, uh, which is measured in magnitudes. So originally, this concept of magnitude was given by Hipparchus. After the sunset, uh, the first set of stars to be seen were first magnitude stars. Then as the sky became darker, the second magnitude star started appearing, then third magnitude star, uh, star started appearing and so on. And when the sky was very, very dark, okay, complete uh, the clear dark sky, uh, you could see uh, the faintest stars and that he called sixth magnitude stars. So the, all these stars, he said, uh, can be categorized into first magnitude to sixth magnitude. Keeping in mind here that since in the evening after sunset, you will be able to see the brightest star, the first magnitude stars are brightest and the sixth magnitude stars are going to be faint. So uh, this is what uh, we have uh, given by Hipparchus and Hipparchus was almost 2000 years ago. We continued this and uh, now we have developed the similar kind of scale based on similar logic but with modern instrumentation. So when measurements were done with the modern instrumentation, it was seen that these magnitudes were related to logarithm of the flux given by those stars. So whatever flux we collect at our instruments, okay, the logarithm of that was related to the magnitude. It was also observed that the first magnitude stars were about 100 times brighter than the sixth magnitude stars. So, uh, keeping that in mind, the entire magnitude scale has been revised now. So, look at this particular magnitude scale over here. What you can observe here is uh, this Vega is given a zero magnitude number. And on the left hand side, the magnitude goes on becoming negative, which means the objects start becoming brighter and brighter. And on the right hand side, the objects start becoming fainter and fainter okay uh, so say uh, for example venus has can have magnitude something like minus four or so the jupiter can have magnitude somewhere around that minus three and so uh, the moon bright moon 
the full moon has a magnitude around minus 12. The sun has a magnitude about minus 27. Okay, and keeping in mind that five magnitude difference gives you 100 times more brightness uh, would mean that uh, 10 magnitude difference will give you uh, 100 into 100, that is 10,000 times more brightness. Uh, and 15 magnitude difference will give you something like uh, 100 into 100 into 100 that is million times brighter object. So you see sun is uh, million times brighter than the full moon and moon appears million times brighter than average stars that we can see. Uh, so this is as far as appearance is concerned that sun appears to be million million times which means a trillion times brighter than the average stars that we can see in the night sky. Now a star may look brighter because it is closer okay or it could be really bright. How do we know that? So to distinguish between these two things we have our apparent and absolute magnitudes. So if star could be brighter for two reasons either it is actually brighter or it is closer to us than other stars. So in order to compare the real brightness, what one does is uh, the astronomers use concept of absolute magnitude. So what is absolute magnitude? You keep all the stars at same location and then find out what could be their apparent magnitude. So we have, for example, uh, they have taken a, uh, a case, they have taken a number that if you put a star at 10 parsec distance, now parsec is one parsec is about 3.26 light years. So 10 parsec makes 32.6 light years. So if you keep a star at uh, 10 parsec distance, okay, what will be its apparent magnitude? Because that apparent magnitude then can be calculated from the flux that we'll receive. Now, uh, keeping this kind of thing, uh, this kind of scale, okay, one can calculate the absolute magnitude of all the stars and then we can really compare their intrinsic or true brightness. So true brightness can be compared by taking into consideration the absolute magnitude. If I uh, take uh, sun's apparent magnitude, it is minus 27, minus 26.8 to be more precise. When its absolute magnitude is about 4.5, which means if sun goes at a distance of 10 parsec, we'll be barely be able to see it in the sky. We will be able to see but not from the city. So we will have to go to the outskirts so that uh, we can see stars with a magnitude of 4.5. So only in the clear sky condition uh, we should be able to see sun uh, if we go at a distance of 10 parsec from sun. So imagine uh, if there are lives and civilizations on a planet at a distance of something like 10 parsec, for them sun is not going to be a very bright star. It is just going to be an average star. The other parameter of stars is the spectral classification. So what are the stars? All, are, all uh, stars are seen or how are they classified from their spectrum? And that is where comes the great work by the Harvard people. So before we come to that classification, let us first understand that what kind of spectrum a star gives. So we know hot objects give continuous spectrum uh, and if you have hot gas then it gives you the line spectrum. Uh, it gives you only bright lines because the electrons will be transiting from one level to another level in that hot gas. Okay, uh, But if you keep the same uh, gas in front of a hot source, okay, even hotter source and then whatever light you get, if you pass that through the prism, what you get is you get from that hot source uh, the continuous spectrum and the gas in between, which is relatively colder than that particular source, is going to absorb exactly at the same location because now electrons only absorbing those uh, radiations of those particular wavelengths will go to the excited state while re-emitting, they can re-emit in all different directions. Therefore, if you are looking only from one particular direction, you will see that those particular wavelengths are relatively less given because they are absorbed by that particular gas and we get absorption line spectrum. So, when we look at stars, what we get is similar kind of a thing. This was the spectrum of sun along with the dark absorption lines first observed by Fraunhofer. Later, when people studied uh, various 
chemical elements here and their spectrum, they realize that different chemical elements can be uh, known or identified based on the wavelengths that they emit. So these are called signature lines and then you have various signature lines for different elements. Knowing this, uh, what people know now is what kind of different elements would be present there on the sun and similarly for stars. So when you take spectrum of a star, you naturally expect to get the continuous spectrum but on top of that there are certain dark lines and based on those dark lines. Uh, people have studied various stars and they have classified these stars according to what kind of lines are present in the absorption spectrum. So let us see this. So based on the absorption lines, uh, we have various groups and those groups have been named as O, B, A, F, E, K, M. And then there are certain numbers. So let us understand what are those numbers. So widely these groups were uh, categorized as O B A K F G, or sorry O B A F G K M. The class O shows mainly hydrogen lines, while class M shows metallic lines. Now metallic lines means what? For astronomers, there is an interesting uh, convention. Anything which is other than hydrogen and helium is called metal. So when uh, you observe oxygen lines or you observe uh, potassium lines or sodium lines, all these lines are considered as metallic lines. Even carbon lines will be considered as metallic lines because anything other than hydrogen and helium is considered, is, is called, is referred as metal by astronomers. So we have these kind of things uh, in case of uh, various stars and based on the how much lines are crowded, the classification was done. It was done in the Harvard observatories and uh, some uh, women astronomers have really contributed in that. So we will see some of their contributions. In this particular classification, if you look at the sun spectrum, sun belongs to class G. Now this is Annie Jem Cannon. Uh, she joined Harvard College Observatory in 1896. And she has done tremendous work in refining and defining this particular classification. She herself analyzed spectra of more than 25,000 stars. Eventually, she classified spectra of uh, more than about uh, 2,25,000 stars, which means she herself did something like 25,000 stars. But then there are a group of uh, people, uh, they were called uh, women computers okay, in Harvard Observatory. So, uh, they collectively had done a lot of work and she classified all that work uh, into uh, this uh, huge big volume, Harvard Ripper classification catalogs. Uh, she discovered simultaneously some 300 variable stars. We'll see what variable stars are and phi no way. Uh, again, we'll see what no way are. Uh, she created finer classification schemes. So for example, when, when we talked about O, B, A, F like that, uh, she said uh, depending on how bright a particular line will appear or how uh, a particular line of particular element uh, may not be there, uh, you can have more categories between O and A or O and B and B and A and uh, A and F and so on. And then she put additional decimal classification. So you have O0, O1, O2 up to O9 and then again B0, B1, B2 up to B9 and so on. So these kind of uh, classification, final classification uh, was done uh, and it is now accepted. So all stars are now classified according to what uh, Annie Jump Cannon did. What was her role there? Okay, in HCO means uh, Harvard College Observatory. So you see a typical uh, photograph here. Now what is this photograph? So people used to take glass plates those days, uh, 100 years back. And on those glass plates, the telescopic image of the stars would be uh, taken. And then uh, you, you have, you, uh, they would keep very thin prism in front of the telescope objective. So instead of having a star spot in the photographic plate, 
you will see a spectrum. You will see a streak of line along with absorption lines. Now, you can imagine in a photographic plate, large number of stars would come and every star would come with a streak of line. Looking at that pattern, you need to identify and classify things. And that is the kind of work she did. So this is the recording from her diary. And she had very sharp eyes and memory to remember what kind of pattern uh, is say O class, what kind of pattern is say F class. And looking at a pattern, you have to note down whether it is this class or that class. And she had a speed of analysis, something like three stars a minute, okay, uh, for this kind of a frame. So three stars a minute she would categorize and uh, develop this kind of, I mean, the amount of work she had done is tremendous here. And a major work was uh, contributed by Dr. Meghna Saha, okay. The classification was done. But what is the interpretation of that classification? Because when you are looking at uh, the different kind of elements, absorption lines present, what it could mean is on those stars, those different chemical elements are present. Now, looking at one star and another star, if you see different chemical elements, absorption lines are present, does it mean that the two stars are different, uh, made out of different kind of chemicals? Or is there a special reason? that you see only certain elements. And that is where uh, Dr. Meghna Saha's contribution come. In 1920, he formulated ionization equation, where he said that is the temperature and electron pressure of the star decide the ratio of ionized to neutral atoms. So depending on temperature and electron pressure, the whether atom will get ionized or not will be decided. The spectra of giant and dwarf stars show presence of absorption due to different elements. Okay, so uh, you may see that particular element is present or particular element is uh, abs uh, absent. Okay, depending on what was the temperature and electron pressure. Saha's equation show that difference in spectral class is not because of difference in chemical composition. In fact, at those times when spectral class came out, there was there were theories uh, that why different stars look different. There are multiple theories. There were theories which say that probably old stars have different chemical composition as compared to young stars. Then there were theories that probably the atoms themselves are becoming old and therefore they start behaving differently. What Saha did was he clearly showed it is all play of temperature and pressure. So Harvard Depart sequence happened to be then arranged according to decreasing temperature. So O class stars therefore must be hottest stars and M class stars must be the coolest star. Now this is all contribution by Dr. Meghna Saha. You might have uh, read his books or referred his books, uh, the books on uh, heat and thermodynamics. Uh, his book with uh, another author, uh, Professor Srivastava, is very famous, Treatise on Heat. Similarly, there is a smaller version of that textbook of heat and they are worth reading. They're interesting books. So now we have the spectral classes of stars, O, o class star to uh, L class star over here. Now, O to M we had considered, then uh, some of these additional categories were added later. So you have o, o class star, for example, having uh, ionized and neutral helium lines and weakened hydrogen lines and their temperature can go about uh, 31,000 Kelvin. Uh, whereas uh, look at this G type star, the sun is G type star. So it has got weaker hydrogen lines and then ionized and neutral metals are there. Metals again, remember, uh, are something other than hydrogen and helium. Okay, And these stars are yellowish in color okay sun like star and the temperature is somewhere around 5250 to uh, approximately 6000 kelvin we know uh, that sun's temperature or surface temperature of the sun is about 5800 kelvin so it nicely fits in this uh, g class uh, then you have even uh, stars which are much cooler m type stars where the temperature can be something like 2000 to about 4000 kelvin 
and what you observe here there are no or almost no hydrogen lines observed in the spectrum you observe neutral metals and you also at times observe molecules okay so uh, now this is the surface of the star we are not talking about what happens in the inside but on the surface uh, when the star light is coming it is absorbed part of it is absorbed by the molecules on these particular stars and therefore you see very crowded lines so large number of absorption lines are observed in this m class stars now if that is the case uh, how do we say that stars are mainly made up of hydrogen and helium because in the universe it is observed that uh, i mean if you look at the chemical abundances the most abundant element is hydrogen next number is helium and rest all is in a small very small fraction number 3 is oxygen number 4 is carbon and so on so how do we know that stars are mainly made up of hydrogen and helium is it only because of uh, absorption lines so another uh, lady has contributed in this and she was cecilia payne gaposkin uh, born in england she studied physics uh, chemistry botany and she completed her studies but was not awarded degree because cambridge was not awarding degrees to women uh, until uh, 1948 and she received fellowship to study harvard college observatory in 1923 uh, in the year 1919 uh, professor eddington had uh, taken expeditions to observe solar eclipse and you from that when they returned from that there was a lecture uh, here in the cambridge that lecture cecilia uh, pain attended and uh, she said my life changed there uh, she started working on uh, astronomy because she decided that this is what i'm going to do uh, if you see uh, earlier she had taken subjects like physics chemistry botany but later she decided no she is going to do physics and she is going to do astronomy and astro she is going to contribute in astrophysics so her phd thesis was stellar atmospheres contribution to the observation and study of high temperature in the reversing layers of stars now this all looks very uh, complicated but we'll see in simple words what she did uh, she did her phd from radcliffe college because harvard was not granting phd to women so though she uh, got scholarship to go over there okay she had to do degree from radcliffe college what she showed was the great variation in stellar absorption lines was due to differing amount of ionization at different temperature and not to different amount of elements so all the spectral classes that we observe in stars they show that different chemical elements are present but it is not because a particular element is present in a huge amount that its absorption lines are seen in a spectrum okay it is mainly because the temperature of that star and the pressure involved is different so she applied magna saha's ionization formula to stars and came to this particular conclusion so she correctly concluded that all the stars are mainly made up of hydrogen and helium okay and she has given lot of praise for magna saha's ionization formula uh, because she said uh, for the first time uh, you can now actually do the analysis of stars and that's why uh, she calls uh, professor saha as father of modern astrophysics now that's a great praise so later she surveyed brighter stars and variable stars to determine paths of stellar evolution now let us talk about stellar synthesis okay so we know that most of the stars are made up of hydrogen and helium but what about other elements do stars create other elements within them now there is in the universe when we observe different kind of elements though all those other elements are in small amount one needs to explain their presence and uh, one of course reasoning could be that during big bang when the entire universe got created when 
hydrogen, helium uh, got created, even other elements got created. But it turns out that it is not a sufficient time and there was no sufficient temperature for sufficient duration to have all this synthesis. And that's where another lady contributes to show that tar synthesizes uh, most of the elements. So let us look at the work by Margaret Burbage. Uh, she died this year uh, on 12th of April, uh, 1919 to 2020. Uh, she was the first woman to receive Bruce Medal, uh, the medal given to uh, the great contribution in astronomy uh, by woman uh, astronomer. She was the first woman to be appointed as director of Royal Greenwich Observatory. Remember. Uh, that even Cambridge was maybe not giving PhD to uh, women. Uh, so this is one of the great uh, achievement. Uh, and uh, she was a Royal Astronomical Society's gold medal also she won. That is again given to the great contribution in astronomy. What was her contribution to astronomy? Yeah, so she published along with other two authors, B2FH paper, what we call or Taylor element synthesis paper. What is this B2FH paper? Uh, Burbage, Burbage, Fowler and Hoyle. Uh, Burbage, Margaret Burbage and her husband uh, Geoffrey Burbage, uh, Fowler and Fred Hoyle. Uh, all these four people contributed to this particular paper. Uh, they, in this paper, they showed that uh, there are different uh, nuclear processes that can be used to uh, explain how various chemical elements can be synthesized. She found uh, technetium lines in the red giant spectra. You must be aware that technetium is the lightest element which does not have any single uh, stable isotope. Okay, All its isotopes are radioactive isotopes. Uh, it was uh, though predicted by Mendeleev. Uh, it got discovered here on Earth uh, in artificial radioactivity only uh, and uh, in radioactive sources uh, it was found by Emilio Sigre. So she found that these technetium lines are observed there in red giant spectra which means uh, the stars surely must be uh, creating different kind of uh, chemical elements. She worked on galaxy structures. And she was also first to measure the mass and composition and rotation curve of galaxies through spectra of rotating ionized gas clouds. So, a lot of uh, important contribution she had done and she was pioneer in quasar studies also. So, we know quasars are, now we know quasars are uh, active galactic nuclei. So, there are uh, galactic nuclei where, uh, which are very, very active because of huge supermassive black hole and uh, they are very far away from us uh, and as the universe is expanding uh, they show a huge amount of redshift. So uh, she was the one of the first to study these objects. She also contributed in development of instrumentation for Hubble Space Telescope. So that was her contribution in astronomy. Coming back to the physics of stars, uh, she showed that there are various processes like R process or rapid process, slow process, which is again a uh, neutron capture process, P processes for proton capture or X process synthesis of uh, deuterium, uh, lithium, beryllium, boron are discussed. Then she uh, showed that supernova light curve indicates its seat of R process, that all rapid processes happen in supernova light curve, or which means in supernova they must be happening. So in the light curve, you can see uh, our processes happening. So there are chemical elements which can happen, which can be produced only with this uh, R process. And then interchange of material between stars and interstellar glass and dust will be sufficient to explain the observed abundances of elements related to hydrogen. Now this is very, very important conclusion she had that uh, the stars whatever chemical element they are producing, they are synthesizing, the exchange of that material with the surrounding, uh, with the interstellar material 
okay, is sufficient to explain whatever chemical abundances we see in the universe. So there is no need to create all these other elements, metallic elements as uh, astronomers would like to call it, uh, in the Big Bang. And the theory of primeval synthesis demands that all the varying conditions occur in the first few minutes and it appears very highly improbable that in very first few minutes if you want to have all chemical elements the temperature required is ha has to be very very large but then most of these processes are not possible because uh, if you go on fusing different kind of chemical elements then unless until uh, lighter element is sufficient quantity the heavier element uh, with that particular temperature may not be uh, it, it may not be able to, possible to generate in larger amount. So uh, the major contribution is you do not need all elements to be created in Big Bang. Uh, they can be nicely created in stars. This is the most important conclusion from her work. Here uh, on this picture some of these uh, elements and their fractional abundance uh, is shown okay so you can see uh, for example over here that alpha process or s process or e process r process all these various processes by which chemical synthesis can happen the nuclear synthesis can happen uh, are given and uh, the relative abundance uh, calculations are done and that is a, this this particular picture is a result from these uh, Suez and array Now we talk about the distances of stars. We have seen that yes, stars are made up of uh, mainly hydrogen, helium. They also have some other chemical elements, okay, and they are bright or they could be dim depending on their distance. Uh, so their temperature can be determined uh, by looking at the spectral classification. And uh, now we have to bother about what is the actual brightness of a star because star may look brighter because it is closer or it may look brighter because it is intrinsically bright. So we need to bother about stars as standard candles. Now what are the standard candles? Standard candles are the objects whose intrinsic brightness is known. So if I keep them at different distances, looking at the flux that we receive or looking at the apparent brightness, we can find out what must be the distance of that particular standard candle. So do we have such kind of standard candles? Yes, in case of stars, similar kind of standard candles are available. And again, uh, important role was played by a woman astronomer in that. So first, in order to understand that, uh, we already talked about apparent and uh, absolute magnitudes. So we know stars can be bright uh, because of uh, reason, two reasons, either intrinsically bright or closer. Okay, so what do we know? How do we find out what is the intrinsic brightness? Now that is where the variable stars play a role. So what are these variable stars? Variable stars are the stars whose brightness varies with time. There are stars whose brightness varies periodically. There are stars. Which, whose brightness vary uh, aperiodically, means random. So variable stars are those whose brightness varies over the time. It can be periodic, aperiodic. The first such variable star was Omicron Ceti. It, it was in the Cetus constellation, uh, one of the stars. And it was discovered in, 19, in 1596 by David Fabricius. You can see here, uh, some simulation here uh, shown here that a star is bright then it is becoming faint again it is becoming bright and it was observed that the period of this variation was about 11 months okay so this today we know is a long period variable star whereas later people started uh, photographing and comparing what are the which are are there any more variable stars and they found really large number of stars with a variable and there were many stars uh, whose period uh, is not 
in months but it is in days there are stars whose period of variation is also in hours so this particular star omicron ceti was later called mira uh, mira meaning wonderful because it behaved that way and there was wonderful behavior so when it is uh, brightest people could see this star uh, in the sky when it is faint we can't see this star because uh, brightness varies above 6 magnitude to below 6 magnitude so when it is brighter than 6 magnitude we can see when it is fainter than 6 magnitude we cannot see so so it is as if the star appears in the sky and then disappears in the sky for few months then again it starts appearing again it disappears for few months the light curve if you plot then it looks like this now here i have shown light curve of vera plotted by aavso aavso stands for american association for variable star observers now this is an association that uh as amateur astronomers to collect data and then all that data is collated and meaningful information is found so aavso provides you a platform to study various variable stars with whatever kind of instrumentation you have and uh, there are a you may uh, go to aavso sites and see what kind of projects what kind of work one can do let's come to this particular uh, star or delta cephei which is in the cps constellation and the night sky uh, let me just put this pointer this cassiopeia is a very prominent constellation which we can use to see the pole star uh this wider angle uh, you can bisect and it goes towards polaris or pole star now near that there is the cepheus constellation and in the cepheus constellation there is a star called delta cephei when people observe its brightness they realize that its brightness changes it doesn't change by large amount it changes by very small amount so we can see the magnitude varies between uh, something like 4 and 1/2 magnitude to 3 and 1/2 magnitude the variation is not much the period is also just few days okay here the period is not shown here the phase is shown depending on when the uh, brightness is maximum but period is also uh, just few days now when you look at this particular star here the it was first uh, realized that this is a periodic star or variable star in 1784 and its pulsation is 5 days 8 hour 37 minutes now you look at the precision with which it is measured and the magnitude varies by plus minus 1 so we have seen the magnitude varies somewhere between uh, 3 Point five to about four point five, and it is a prototype of kind of pulsating star. Now, prototype means there are large number of stars whose behavior is similar. When we say behavior, what it means is uh, the light curve is similar, and when the light curve is similar, uh, we see uh, this kind of, uh, I mean, particular kind of star, because particular kind of physics must be driving this variation in the brightness. so stars when you take a standard candles this particular star can be taken as standard candle and the work uh, by henrietta swain levitt uh, is very important in this case what did, what was her contribution to astronomy she was employed at harvard college observatory to determine the magnitude of stars from photographic plate as we saw uh, there were people who were looking at uh, spectrum of stars and there were people who were looking at photographic plates and determining the magnitude uh, most of those people would uh, look at the photographic plate through microscope and then uh, make their observations as a part of this project she discovered more than 2400 variable stars so what you need to do here is you take a photographic plate for one particular day and then you take a photographic plate of maybe say next week or maybe next day or it could be 15 days depending on uh, the stars that we want to study and then you blink them 
So you take image of first star, then you immediately take image of the second star. Again, uh, I mean image image taken at some other date. Exactly the same location of the star. So most of the stars will uh, remain will will be seen as single point object. But if star's brightness is changing, you will see the spot on that photographic plate slightly enhanced or slightly decreased. And that's where you know that there is a star which is variable. So once you have determined that yes, in this particular frame, in this particular region of the sky, there are these five variable stars, then what you can do is you can focus on only those particular stars, those particular regions, and then uh, you can study it in greater details. Uh, so, initially, when you are just spanning the sky, uh, you don't know which stars are going to be variable. So, you will randomly take photographs. But when you go to take photograph, you will note down that at what coordinate you have taken photograph, in which region of the sky you have taken photograph, and exactly the same region you must uh, record, you must photograph some other day. And when you do that, and then you compare, that is where you can find out whether a star is variable or not. And that's how she. Uh, found out uh, something like 2400 variable stars from looking at those photographs. She used data of 25 variable stars from SMC. SMC stands for Small Magellanic Cloud, which is a satellite galaxy around Milky Way galaxy, okay, to decide the period and luminosity relation. So, what she did was she took uh, SMC, uh, this particular galaxy, took the photographs of those, determined 25 variable stars within that particular galaxy, looking at the photographs again, okay. And then she uh, compared what is the period of their variation and what is the luminosity. So, a star could be brighter and we have a longer period or it could have shorter period what she observed was this interesting relationship here shown on this particular graph with red dots. What she realized that if the luminosity is higher or the intensity or the star is very bright, its period of variation is also very large. Now again, coming back to the same question, the star may look brighter because it could be closer. So how, how do we relate these two things? So that's why the choice of SMC. SMC is not in our galaxy, it is a satellite galaxy. So, it is at such a large distance that all the stars sitting inside SMC will be approximately at same distance from us. So, it is like putting all the stars almost at the same distance away from us and now you study that luminosity and period relation and you got, uh, you get very interesting result. So, looking at this, now what we can do is, suppose we have an unknown galaxy. I don't know what is the distance of that galaxy. But I take photographs and I realize that there are variable stars. So I'll focus on the variable star there. I'll find out what is the period. I'll check on this, that for this particular period, what must be the original luminosity. That will give me the absolute magnitude. And by looking at the star, I will know what is the apparent magnitude. So, knowing how much is the apparent magnitude and how much is the absolute magnitude, we can surely determine what must be the distance of that particular galaxy. Or similarly, we can also determine the distances of various star clusters within our own galaxy. Because now, once, the, once this period luminosity relationship is established, okay, uh, we can generalize it and apply it to different stars within our galaxy as well as in different galaxies. There is, there was a small uh, group of stars called RR Lyrae also. So, this is another kind of variable stars, but right now we will not talk about these stars because for our uh, purpose, mainly this Cifid variable stars were very important because that is what uh, was used uh, to study uh, the period luminosity relation. But there are other kind of variable stars and they have been categorized as Cepheid variable, long period variable, RR Lyrae type variable. Uh, within Cepheid variable, there, there is something called del W originist kind of variable stars and so on. Now, when we do all this, 
how do we know? I mean, with all this information, how do we know what star does and what how it progresses in life? Suppose I take, uh, I mean, because stars, whatever stars are doing, they are doing for millions of years and we are not studying them for so much of time. So how do we know, how do we say anything confidently that after million years, the star will behave like this and so on. Now for this, to understand, imagine uh, I am tossing a coin. Suppose I toss a coin and I am assuming that coin is fair coin, which means there is 50% chance of head, 50% chance of tail. If I toss a coin thousand times, what is the outcome? I approximately uh, expect that approximately 500 times head should come, 500 times tail should come. It may not be exactly 500, there will be some fluctuation, but the fluctuation is not going to be very large. Okay, now instead of that, if I do toss coin once, but 1000 coins, all identical, fair coins. So if I toss 1000 coins simultaneously, what is the result? Again, I expect approximately 500 will give me head, 500 will give me tail. Now you see, this is, the, these are two different experiments, but they are giving me similar results. I toss a coin 1000 times or I toss 1000 coins once. They give me the same result. This principle we also use to study stars. I want to know how, how star behaves for say million years. So what I can do is, I need not wait for million years. I can study millions of stars for a few years and see what happens. So statistically, then we can get some kind of information about stars. And let's see when you do that, what happens. So here, this Hertzring and Hertzring and Russell have plotted various different stars on this graph where vertical axis is absolute magnitude and horizontal axis is spectral class. What they observed was large number of stars were sitting on this particular belt called main sequence. There were few stars which were sitting here, which we call giants. We'll see why. There were some stars which were sitting here in this group and there were some stars which were sitting in this group. You don't find stars randomly distributed in the entire box. Large number of them sitting along the main sequence and few of them sitting in giant and super giant group and also few of them sitting in the white dwarf group. As you go from left to right, the spectral class changes from O to M, which means the temperature reduces. As you go from bottom to top, the absolute magnitude goes on becoming more and more negative. And remember, more negative absolute magnitude means it is brighter object. So stars are becoming brighter and brighter. So what you observe here, the hot stars are typically bluish in color. The relatively cold stars are typically reddish in color. And that is what we can guess from the Wien's displacement law, the stars behave like perfectly black bodies. So the wavelength that we they are giving maximum amount of radiation multiplied by their temperature will be constant. So higher the temperature, smaller wavelength they are going to give more radiations and that is what we observe here. So most of the stars are found in this belt. What it means is coming back to that calculation of coins that large number of stars are seen in this belt also means typically a star spends huge amount of its life in this belt. Small number of stars are spending here means star typically spends less amount of time in this belt, in this region. 
then you have red giant stars now what is meant by red giant and how do you know that these are giants because even if i use telescope i am not able to see a star as a huge big object except for sun even distant stars are they appear as point objects so how do i know that these are giant stars so if you look at their spectral class the temperatures are low now stephen's law tells us that the amount of radiation given out by a perfectly black body and stars give spectrum which is similar to perfect black body therefore we can apply stephen's law there okay so the amount of radiation given out is proportional to fourth power of its temperature and area of the object now because these are low temperature stars we expect them to give less amount of radiation but in reality they are giving large amount of radiation because their absolute magnitudes are more negative what does it mean it means their surface area must be really very large therefore they are giving more amount of flux and that's why we say these must be giant stars exactly on the other way these stars they are giving less amount of uh, i mean their, their temperature is very high so we expect that they should be giving a huge amount of uh, light because uh, stephen's law says that radiation is proportional to fourth power of temperature and the temperature go somewhere 20000 kelvin or so but they are not giving very large amount of light their their absolute magnitude is much much more positive means they are very faint so their surface area must be very very small and therefore you call them dwarf stars so because of these colors these giants are called red giants and because these are very hot they must be giving out effectively white light or bluish light but their surface area must be very small and therefore size must be very small and you call them white dwarfs then super giant phase is again observed but less number of stars are over there uh, here what you observe is the temperature is not very very low but the absolute magnitude is really huge it means these are again the for this particular color of or the for this particular temperature okay you expect most of the stars to give absolute magnitude around uh, 0 to 5 but actually their absolute magnitude is somewhere near minus 7 minus 8 what does it mean it means that their surface area must be really very large and they must be giving out huge amount of radiation we are going to see all this in one very interesting patch of the sky around orion constellation let us look at different objects so we have this orion constellation there is an object called m42 or orion nebula near this dagger or these three stars which are just below the belt so it is called orion's dagger uh, as if the dagger is uh, attached to his belt so this m42 is a cloud of stars a cloud of uh, hydrogen gas and uh, we'll see that object then we'll see another object here which is sirius sirius has a companion called sirius b there is a conspicuous bright object betelgeuse this is one of the uh, great star then there is a uh, object here called m1 or crab nebula and there is uh, this particular cluster of stars pleiades so we are going to focus on these objects here orion nebula sirius betelgeuse crab nebula pleiades cluster and we will see why because they indicate different phases of stars life so first we come to orion nebula it is called a stellar nursery it is observed that uh, the the large i mean all stars are born inside huge cloud of gas and dust so this orion nebula is mainly uh, made up of hydrogen gas hydrogen and helium gas and dust it is very important that dust should be present uh it shines due to light produced by the new stars which are born inside the nebula 
okay the new stars are being born and because of that the entire cloud shines otherwise the cloud is going to be dark it, it doesn't have its own light so it is shining by light of very bright stars which are born there so we know now though now know that okay and i said uh, that dust is important the reason is there is interesting physics problem one can do uh, if you take two hydrogen atoms we know hydrogen atoms are not very stable they will form molecule here on earth but suppose you take two hydrogen atoms in space how do you form hydrogen molecule out of them they have to combine they must collide and that collision must be perfectly inelastic collision so that hydrogen molecule will form but if you do uh, such kind of problem that perfectly inelastic collision you know uh, it has to observe the conservation of momentum and conservation of energy also should be there though mechanical energy will not be conserved so we we know that when such kind of collision happens okay some amount of energy should be absorbed and it turns out that this amount of energy which is absorbed in this perfectly inelastic collision by two hydrogen atoms this energy is greater than the uh, bond breaking energy for two hydrogen molecules so it is impossible to form hydrogen molecule in space only when the dust particles are there some other particles are there which will serve uh, to take that extra energy okay the hydrogen molecules can form so you see uh, to explain these things okay even simple things like hydrogen molecule formation in space okay physics problems become very useful the basic physics problems become useful the second object that we are going to see is the pleiades it is an open cluster and it is made of, of young stars okay and uh, this particular cluster reason i am showing here is uh, such kind of open clusters are formed when star formation takes place inside any nebula so single stars are not generally formed stars are generally formed as a cluster next object we were going to look at was betelgeuse a red giant star okay uh, it was in news since last year because betelgeuse uh, was losing its brightness so there were news like this that probably betelgeuse star may explode uh, and we don't know when it is going to explode uh, and if it explodes as supernova uh, will it affect life on earth because as we have seen betelgeuse star is not very far away it is approximately 500 light years away which is not a very large distance as com as compared to many astronomical objects so is it going to be a problem it is because betelgeuse was supposed to be the 10th bright star in the night sky had become 21st bright object in the night sky its its brightness had gone down and those who were observing uh, regularly because betelgeuse is very easily uh, visible in the sky those who were observing very regularly could clearly see that yes now betelgeuse is not very bright so what is the i mean what is going to happen to this metal use it was in news for a long time then another news came and that said that probably like there are spots observed on sun there are going to be uh, spots here observed on uh, metal use now this is not the real photograph of uh, spots on metal use okay this is just a artistic uh, impression but then this kind of thing could be there now why there are sun spots or dark spots there on the sun that's because of the magnetic field of sun that sun rotates differentially which means its central part rotates faster its near pole region rotates relatively slowly so magnetic field lines get continuously get trapped and then there are magnetic loops formed and then the charged particles in the sun okay they remain uh, trapped inside those magnetic bottles and they are not able to get the heat from the bottom layers due to convection and when that happens those regions become relatively cool and then it becomes relatively because it is cooler uh, it doesn't give much of light 
So, you see sunspots are known to people. People know that sunspots have a regular cycle. So, studying these kind of things, uh, now we are coming to the question, can we study such kind of spots on other stars? So, it seems, yes, we are yes, developing the technology where now we do not do do not treat star as point objects even with our instruments, okay, certain features on the surface of stars are possible to study now. So, that is why Betelgeuse becomes important because uh, you know, any astronomer, uh, you know, Betelgeuse is one of the very bright stars and he is a, it is one of the first stars he gets introduced to. Then we come to the Sirius B. Now, Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky. Sirius B is supposed to be its companion, which we can't see with our normal telescopes. How do we know that, well, that star exists? So, the motion of Sirius was studied and uh, this is the recent data, but it was studied in the last century also, where uh, you could see that the motion of the star is not straight, it is wobbling, it is zigzag path. Now, this is possible only if it is revolving around another object, but that other object is not visible. So, that other object, if it is not visible, what does it mean? It means it is faint, but why it could be faint? It could be white dwarf. The, the star whose surface area is very, very small and therefore, it may not be giving out light. See, why we are claiming that it could be a star? because its mass is very large. So, the mass tells us that that other object, though it is not giving out light, must be uh, a star because uh, you can't have a planet of that big mass. You can't have planet comparable to, uh, having mass comparable to stars. Okay. So, so, so it was expected that it could be at some kind of star which is invisible. And later, using certain other techniques that you can block the light coming from Sirius, it was observed that yes, there is another star and uh, it turned out that it is a white dwarf star. So, using again Stephen's law, uh, we guess that it must be a very small star and therefore it is giving out relatively less amount of light. But when people studied the spectrum, they realized the temperature is very high and therefore it came out as uh, a different kind of star, a white dwarf star. Another Indian has contributed an understanding white dwarf star, Chandrasekhar. He got Nobel Prize for that. So, S. Chandrasekhar uh, calculated that what could be the upper mass of white star, white dwarf star, and that uh, is 1.4 times mass of the sun. So, we call today that as Chandrasekhar limit. So, we know that we can't have white dwarf stars which are heavier than this Chandrasekhar limit. Then object uh, we wanted to see was a crab nebula. So, the crab nebula is a remnant of a magnificent death. This particular region uh, observed that there was a bright star which suddenly appeared in the sky in 1054 C. C means current era or what we call AD. Now, it was recorded in various parts of the world. It was recorded in China and there are inscriptions, there is, there is one inscription in Kashmir which probably indicates to this observation. Now, this was uh, in the month of July and therefore, uh, probably in larger part uh, of India, it was not visible. See, uh, recently there was Neo Wise Comet, okay, very prominent comet it was, but from India, most of the places people could not observe because of rainy season. So, point is uh, this particular star was, I mean there, there uh, a new star appeared in that particular region and it was very bright and for some days it could be seen even during daytime. So, that was called supernova. Now, nova means new star that suddenly the brightness of star increases and previously invisible star starts becoming visible. So, it is called nova and supernova means the explosion, the star explodes in such a large uh, 
energy, with such large energy, that amount of radiation given out is very large. The change in the magnitude is huge. And then you uh, see star becoming very, very bright during that time. Today, if we observe in the same region using telescopes, we can see a fuzzy patch. With our amateur telescope, we see a fuzzy patch. With Hubble Space Telescope, this is what you see. This is a picture taken by Hubble Space Telescope. Using radio astronomy instrument, we know that there is a pulsar sitting at the center of this nebula. What is this pulsar? Pulsar means it gives out radio pulses. Why it is giving out radio pulses? Because what has happened is the core of the star collapsed into neutron star. The neutron star had its own magnetic field. The, radi the charged particle tend to move along the magnetic field direction. So whatever particles are getting accelerated along that particular direction, they start giving out uh, electromagnetic waves. And simultaneously that core has started rotating faster and faster because uh, the angular moment of conservation. So when the entire core collapsed into very small volume, the angular velocity increased. So now we have effectively a radio beam which is sweeping in the sky. Okay, And that radio beam, if it intercepts Earth's orbit or if it intercepts Earth, then our radio telescope can observe those radio pulses. So fortunately, uh, we are able to uh, see those radio pulses here uh, from this particular region and therefore we know what must have happened over there. A star exploded, the core contracted and it turned into the uh, neutron star. So a small particular region that we are looking at can tell us different life phases of a star. That star is born in clouds. It is born typically as a group of star clusters. Then it evolves its life for a long time. The age of star depends on how much mass it has. The larger the mass, age is relatively less because it has to burn huge amount of uh, nuclear fusion to hold itself against the gravity. And when the, uh, the internal nuclear fusion reaction uh, gets over, uh, star may, the it may collapse into white dwarf or it may collapse into neutron star. Okay, so these all things we can see in particular region of sky, but not with the same kind of instruments. So <clears throat> to recap, what we can say is sun is not a very big star. If you look at the comparison size, this is VV Cephe star, then there is KW Sagittarius star, then there is a Pistol star, Antares is over here, Antares is again one of the famous star in Indian astronomy, it is called uh, Jeshtha. Then Betelgeuse star is smaller than Antares, but it is still a red giant star. And then the size of sun uh, is just a small dot. So you can imagine how big a star could be. So sun is not really a big star. It is. It, it, it may appear to be a small star. But there are much many more stars which are even smaller than sun. So as you go as you study with more and more powerful telescopes, you can see even fainter and fainter stars. And it is realized that though sun is not a very big star, it is not a very small star also. There are larger number of stars which are smaller than sun. And as we have seen uh, that if star is having smaller mass, it will live longer. The smaller they are, longer they live. And those smaller stars are the places where we may search for intelligent lives because it will give sufficient time for life to evolve. If a star is huge, big, it may not have sufficient life. It will explode. And if any kind of planet is around in uh, orbit, okay, either that planet will go far away or whatever civilization could be there on that planet during that explosion, everything will go away. So, the places where we may search for intelligent lives are the small stars. So the astronomy remains very interesting and as the famous uh, science popularizer Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is within us. We are made up of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. Thank you.